Then after three months of competition, the America's summer season now comes to an epic conclusion. We've seen the world's top Hearthstone players compete with strategy and wit as competitors rise and fall in emotional victories. Now it's time to crown a new champion. Eight players from across the Americas will battle to earn a chance at glory and a share of the $100,000 prize pool. Pull up a chair and catch all the action. The Hearthstone Americas Summer Championship starts right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Hearthstone Championship Tour America's Summer Championship. I'm here with the first two semifinalists for the first match of the day. It's Hot Meowth and Dude7597. I'll just get a couple words with them before their match. Uh, Hot Meowth, you first. Uh, nobody's picked you across the weekend on their prediction boards. Are you still feeling confident? How are you feeling in general going into your, your first match here? I mean, me and Tarei kind of play with the same classes and like kind of same lineup style, so... Sucks for them because I think me and Tyree picked the best lineup. All right, well that's a lot of confidence. And dude, now how did what did you do to sort of prepare for your match coming into today? You sort of got a lot riding on it because there was three people that picked you to win the whole thing. Yeah, well I wasn't sure exactly how I wanted to prepare, but I got back from dinner and uh, Nablor and Daisy and Wolf just called me, and I was like, oh hey, what's up guys? And they were like, dude, you have to practice, and uh, so. I just practiced with um, with both of them. All right. Well, good luck, guys. Go ahead and shake hands, and you can get into your match there. And we're going to jump right into the first semifinal of the day. But before we do that, let's uh, hear what these guys had to say. Today's match went really well, I think. That is enough. That is going to be more than enough. And dude, 7597 looking noticeably relieved as he takes a win. Today's matchup was pretty stressful. I almost got reverse swept by Monsanto. And no! That's it! But Ian and I played through, so it feels good. My next opponent is Dude7597. So I know him from quite a while back. So definitely a friend and like a experienced player. Uh, I've been friends with Hot Meowth on Battle.net for uh, probably about a year now. I think he's a pretty solid player. So it was kind of sad that I had to face him like top four, but I need to get um, to BlizzCon, so. He's just a stepping stone in IDB, huh? The hardest thing going against him will probably be just staying focused and not succumbing to my nerves. It all comes down to like how I prepare the lineup for tomorrow and stay relaxed in the game and don't misplay. If I were to assign a playstyle to Hot Meowth, uh, I would say it is very aggressive. D7597, you might be good at Frisbee. I'm better than you at Hearthstone. Let's just let our games decide who's better. Welcome to the casting desk. My name is Fred. I'm joined once again by Brian Kibler. It appears that we are Siamese twins, inseparable <laughs> at the hip, uh, at least for this weekend. Brian, I am really excited to bring this entire match with you. Uh, what's it like, man, being semifinal number one between Dude and Hot Me Out? Those are some fighting words. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I love the the uh, little bit of trash talk between the two of them. Mm -hmm. you, know, you may be good at Frisbee. I'm better at Hearthstone. It's like, ah, we'll, we'll, we'll let the games decide. We'll yeah. let the late games decide. So... Uh, we are about to let those games begin, at least, as Nefarian would say. And here we are in game one. It will be the Hunter Mirror match. Oh, this is uh, not what I was expecting to start off the series. As I didn't really think Hunter would be that fast of a pick. I always tend to see Druids or, you know, maybe Hot Meowth was feeling another class, too, that specifically because he has a lot more of the proactive ones. Um, as you do see, of course, Dude banning the Warrior way and Hot Meowth banning the Shaman. Very standard picks. Yeah, Hot Meowth, uh, he generally decided to ban Shaman rather than Warrior, which was a very common ban among uh, a lot of other players throughout the preliminary, uh, in part because of his choice of his particular Warrior deck in his lineup as well. He's also not playing Freeze Mage, doesn't need to worry about uh, that armor stacking problem. It will be a Bat versus Bat here uh, huh? on turn one. That's right. Named, of course, after world champion Firebat in 2014. Uh, big shout out to him. Hope he's doing well. Um, now, I like this matchup when it's relatively even after the first couple of turns. I think there's a lot of nuance that just goes lost because it's it, 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 people tend to oversimplify the matchup of whoever gets ahead in terms of damage. But there's a lot of um, there's a lot of 
importance of every single decision in the early game, which ends up leading to what feels like the inevitable outcome in the mid late stages of the game. Uh, and and uh, look no further than players like, for example, when I listen to RDU talk about Hunter vs. Hunter, which used to be one of his favorite matchups. I'm not sure these days if that's the case, but he still is very vocal about how all these small decisions end up becoming huge later on. Yeah, this is a matchup that can very easily uh, get out of hand if one player missteps even a little bit in the, uh, the early to mid turns of the game. Uh, and Dude, fortunately for him, has no turn three play, is able to trade off, but uh, Hot Meowth has an animal companion, and it is in fact always Huffer. Yep. And Huffer tends to be really powerful because of how much pressure he can put on. In some instances, you don't really want to put that much pressure because of how easy it is to, to get killed as just a two health minion. But in this case, nothing was on board already from Dude, and he doesn't have easy clean removal for it. Uh, well, until he drew the quick shot, but that's still a very inefficient play because he's still stuck hero powering, so most likely one of the four mana minions is what he's also contemplating. Yeah, it looks like Dude is going to go ahead and play the Infested Wolf. Barnes would be a little bit of a gamble if he could find himself a uh, Savannah High Main could be quite powerful, but decides to go with the more consistently powerful the play. <laughs> And uh, Hot Meowth, recognizing that he is ahead, this is one of the, the characteristics of the Hunter matchup. Trying to figure out when you want to trade, when you want to go face. A lot of people sort of think back to face Hunter, and they think, you know, oh, you always attack your opponent and just burn them out. But it, mid range Hunter uh, matchups are a lot different because of the presence of something like a Houndmaster, which we see in Dude's hand right now. Uh, oftentimes, you, you may want to trade to reduce your opponent's ability to use Houndmaster or, or kill command and things like that. And Dude already looking for ways to squeeze in that Houndmaster if he can use it to protect his life total and start winning back the board. He has called the wild and he is the one going first over his opponent so he gains that extra mana crystal which is usually an important advantage if you're able to follow every single turn with a powerful play. Um, and this is sort of the, the struggle of what happened when Dude was stuck hero powering on that turn three. And Dude, he's going to go ahead and trade in here and then use the Houndmaster uh, to ensure that he has a full three health taunt. He could have Houndmastered first and attacked in, would have left himself with only a one health taunt, uh, which would be much easier for Hot Meowth to break through. So Hot Meowth, uh, interestingly enough, is the hunter expert for the uh, Vicious Syndicate Data Reaper. So this is a, a, a matchup that I imagine uh, he has some pretty strong opinions on. Yep, um, and this is one of the interesting crossroads which Hot Meowth has to start weighing. You know, the, Unleash the Hound's pretty good value right now, but he also has the ability to coin the Savannah High Main. However, if he saves the coin, he can use it for Call of the Wild in the next couple turns. Problem with High Main is he's well aware of Dude having the possibility of that single Freezing Trap, uh, which could punish him if his opponent developed and played the Freezing Trap. So these are the things that are all going through his mind. He's weighing the probability of it. Yeah, the Freezing Trap is one of the really uh, distinctive differences between these two lists. Dude is playing a more beast-focused list. Uh, he has the Tundra Rhino. He also has that, that single Freezing Trap, the uh, huge Toads. He actually also has a Knife Juggler, where uh, Hot Meowth's list is a little bit lower to the ground. We actually see those cards coming out with the Abusive Sergeant and Argent Squire that he uh, played earlier as well. So this is kind of the the difference in design manifesting in this game as Hot Meowth came out a little bit, uh, came out of the gates a little bit faster able to get a little bit more pressure on uh, and now is looking to leverage his hero power and burn spells to finish the game off since dude is just at such low life but if dude can come back here uh, he has a little bit more overall power in his hand with his own high main and another call, and his call of the wild as well yeah it's hard though cuz Dude's trying to figure out a way he doesn't just die in the next yeah. couple of turns. Yeah. This high main is a card that's very difficult for uh, for Dude to deal with. He can just trade his board into it and leave the hyenas, but is going to go ahead and leave it on the board, perhaps hoping that maybe he can find his freezing trap to neutralize it. Uh, but Hot Meowth actually even has to unleash the hounds, so a freezing trap will will do nothing even if drawn. Counting how much damage he has maximum this turn, just seems like he can deal uh, 13, 13, I believe. Yeah, so it's not enough. 
And um, Hot Meowth also has to keep in mind like the, the, the counter swing, but when he's at 23 health, it does seem unlikely his opponent can deal with it. I think dude's also going to feel like he needs to get some kind of taunt, so perhaps Animal Companion next turn is going to be his way to bail him out. Because right now, Hot Meowth's pressure is just, he's just going to continue to put the life total and race his opponent to zero. Yeah, Hot Meowth recognizing here that he has hero power, Kindly Grandmother Kill Command that he has available to him next turn. There is essentially no okay. way that, well, even with this Houndmaster. Hot Meowth uh, decided to, right. to play his turn last turn in such a way that he is guaranteed lethal damage through the kill command and the, the two cost beast plus his hero power. So despite this Houndmaster draw from Dude, Hot Meowth navigated the game in the previous turn so that he doesn't need to do any more minion damage. He can just finish him off with burn. Yeah, so uh, this this is very astute observation from Hot Meowth, realizing that the kill command plus hero power is seven. Uh, dude did also got Misha, so by all means, he had a very strong board. And if he had one extra turn, this could have definitely turned around, but it's just that's the, the nature of uh, the matchup. It gets extremely explosive very quickly. Well, I think a lot of players in Hot Meowth Seat may not have made that play with Unleash the Hounds. It seems like it's fairly minimal. You're not, your opponent doesn't have a huge board, but he decided to recognize, okay, even if you are able to build a big board of taunts, I just have lethal damage if I get in these two extra points from these Hounds. Yeah, uh, perhaps, for example, Kindly Grandmother could have came out. It's a very st stable minion, very hard for your opponent to remove. Enables Kill Command, potentially. So I, I like that Hot Meowth is able to spot this, and that could have made all the difference. Yeah, and uh, he is able to finish the game, so Hot Meowth takes a 1-0 lead over the dude. All right, very important win there, just getting off on the right foot. And with that, uh, Hot Meowth has proven that he is the hunter expert, at least for this series. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, uh, with that fast game number one, uh, we are going to show you guys a quick piece on the dude as we get ready for game number two. Talk to me a little bit about your, your life outside of Hearthstone. What do you like to do? My main passion is uh, mostly just Ultimate Frisbee. I've been playing since fifth grade. Um, in high school, I won a state championship with my high school. In college, we went to nationals last year. How was that experience? Nationals was something else. Like the field complex was massive. I think there were 40 teams there. It's a really cool experience being able to play against like some of the best players in the world. So do you think your experience with playing Ultimate Frisbee at a high level has helped with playing Hearthstone competitively? Is there any connection there? There definitely is a connection. I think the, the kind of the competitive mentality I have is similar for both. I really just love being competitive in all aspects of life. In Hearthstone, I get to do that with my mind, and in Frisbee, I get to do that with my body. Do the players on your Ultimate Frisbee team know about your your Hearthstone success? Uh, yeah, they make fun of me a lot for it, but <laughs> it's all good-natured. They'll be watching this weekend. All right, so we learned that dude is quite the gambler because, you know, fr Frisbee can be a pretty random game sometimes, Kibler. <laughs> Never know where the wind is or if uh, a dog just comes running by and grabs the Frisbee in the air. I imagine when you're playing competitive Ultimate Frisbee, there's probably not that many dogs around. I would hope there would be. Well, if I invited you to come spectate, then maybe that's the case. Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps. But we will be into game two here. Shiro, literally the Yogg-Saron of Frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> Shiro's not really a, a, a dog uh, who runs around catching Frisbee. Oh, clearly He's not. He's more of a lap dog. Yeah, <laughs> you, you spoil Shiro too much, man. I see him just way too fluffy. I spoil him the correct <laughs> amount. Uh, game number two is Warrior versus Shaman. It's going to be Dragon Warrior up against uh, the Shaman deck from Hot Meowth. Now, this is the matchup that's been played um, tens of thousands of times over the past couple of months, primarily because it's, one, it's two of the most popular decks currently in the metagame. Yeah, and the this is a matchup where uh, a big part of the rise for Dragon Warrior was its ability to be successful against aggressive Shaman decks. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the power of both Fiery Warax and Alex Strauss's champion for contesting the board early, and Dude has both of them in his opening hand. Yeah, and he should be able to deal with whatever turn one that comes from Hot Meowth. Um, he didn't play anything, so in fact that gives Dude the edge. He doesn't no longer have to coin and respond to it. And here, Dude has access to uh, coin and champion plus Warax. He's debating, I think, uh, uh, the fact that he wanted to wait on Warax for turn two so he could also use Blood to Icker to kill a Totem Golem, which is exactly right. the sequence of plays that's happening right here. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the flexibility of keeping his coin. And as a result, Hot Meowth is pretty annoyed by this because now he's not only overloaded, so his plays are awkward, but he can't even really deal with the existing board right now. Yeah, he's going to have Argent Squire or Totem is his best play here. I imagine we'll, we'll likely see him use the Totem uh, to enable the possibility of Thing from below in a future turn. But this is really just not the position the aggressive Shaman deck wants to be in. Not only did it have his best early threat removed, but now his opponent has the board and uh, he has nothing. And Dude has a lot more follow-up. Um, the Alex Strauss's champion is very potent, just puts some immense amount of pressure. Hot Meowth is stuck playing minions that feed directly into it. Two threes don't line up very well against the Al Alex Strauss's champion. So th this is going to be brutal. Yeah, this is sort of the classic Dragon Warrior game where uh, big minions just coming out early on. Oh, speaking of big minions early on, there is Hot Meowth with a Flame Wreath Faceless. Okay. And Dude does not have an Execute. So that might swing the tempo of this game uh, a little bit. Yeah, uh, that is one of the ways you can draw heat off yourself. Choose a thing from below, uh, right. another minion that just has a lot of stats. I think the overload is a little bit too punishing given his hand context. He's got two Feral Spirits. Uh, he'd love to get those out, and the Flame Wreath faces would complicate things a lot. He also just is afraid of the possibility of Execute. Mm -hmm. If here, for instance, if this gets executed, he still has multiple plays he can make next turn. Uh, but if his Flame Wreath faces were to get executed, he'd be in a much worse position. Yeah, he, it feels like a blowout at that point. We did see Dude just pick up the Curator, which has been an interesting addition to these Dragon Warrior decks. Uh, Curator, uh, obviously one of the new Karazhan cards that gives the Dragon Warrior deck much more staying power late in the game because you can pick up not only a dragon, uh, of which there are many in the deck, but also potentially Fierce Monkey uh, or Sir Finley Murgleton. So a huge burst of, of mid to late game resources available from that card. That was one of the ways that you would try and beat the Dragon Warrior. You would try to out-resource them because they didn't have much card draw source. That's why you often saw Sir Finley pick Life Tap, yep. if possible. Uh, the Hunter Hero Power, of course, was another way to close the game as if you're drawing a two-mana spell. So, uh, Dude, having that Curator in his deck is a, a great addition from Karazhan. Yeah, and Dude picking up a, a Fierce Monkey, one of the additions to the deck because of the Curator, uh, many versions of Dragon Warrior. Some would have played maybe one of these before just because it's a solid three-mana minion. Uh, but, but due to the inclusion of the Curator, this becomes a fuel for that late-game card advantage as well because it is a beast. Uh, so Dude right now has a couple of options at his disposal. He can start playing his cheaper minions because he would lose the dragon value from the Alex Draza's champion charge if he plays Azure Drake. And I kind of like that a lot better. It's also a very sturdy board because it's not easily removed through a lightning storm. It's not easy to deal with all this high health. And the attacks are just annoying enough that it's a significant pressure. So I, I think this is a lot stronger than just playing the Azure Drake. The interesting decision is what exactly Dude does from here. Because he could just spend 9 damage to the face. Uh, he could remove that Argent Squire with two attacks. It's a lot of missed damage, but could potentially protect his board a little bit against the possibility of Flame Tongue plus Abusive, which is, in fact, precisely what Hot Meowth has. Yeah, I think it's losing too much damage in the long run, though, because if you put that, uh, if you if you put your opponent on Flame Tongue and you try to trade away the, the Argent Squire. You're giving that hard that Squire as if it was a 1-6 minion, and it's just too much life and too much value to lose. Plus, you're coming up on turn 6, you dealt your opponent down to 15. It just feels like a really significant amount of pressure, especially if you happen to set up Draconoid Crush. Yeah, and, and Dude does decide to go over the face, uh, and then Hot Meowth gets some good trades here, able to clear off quite a bit of uh, Dude's board. And now, with no obvious play for turn 6, Dude kind of has to go to the tank here. Yeah, you know, you could always just uh, see what you draw off the Azure Drake. You never know if it ends up being Execute or perhaps Second Blood to Icker, so you can get an easy removal, because you are starting to be afraid of how much pressure your opponent's putting out. He does have 12 damage and at 21. When your opponent's coming up on seven mana, that's a lot of explosive potential. Yeah, that Flame Wreath Faceless is really scary here. Already took out a Twilight Guardian and now threatening to take out even more minions or just dude's life total. Only at 21, that's not many hits from a 7-7. Seven, seven. 
And, you know, I think dude right now is just exploring different lines. Is there a line where I can be aggressive even? You know, can I pressure my opponent out of the game? Should I be playing defensive and trading, picking up value trades with either the two ones um, uh, on his Alex Draza's champions? I still think that being a little bit more proactive is better, and that's why I like Azure Drake a little bit. You never know also if you get that one mana cost card, which is important. And dude finds Corkron Elite, which is interesting because he has the Grom as well and has the potential to try and play a, a very aggressive game here, attacking uh, Hot Me Out's face, but decides to go ahead and make some trades. This leaves him with two three ones, one of which can easily get eaten by that uh, Argent Squire. But those trades were going to be available to Hot Me Out in the following turn, perhaps better because of the Flame Tongue Totem, or at least the threat of Flame Tongue Totem that exists. So I feel like over the past couple of turns, Hot Meowth can actually extrapolate a lot of information on Dew's hand. I think first, you saw your opponent had Azure Drake on five, chose not to play it. Instead, chose to play Axe Champion and the Fierce Monkey. Um, so you can kind of interpret that his hand's not really dragon-based. Um, he also doesn't have Execute because he clearly would have used it. So I think you can even put your opponent potentially on things like Curator and start pushing the tempo a little bit more because you know your opponent's trying to be really defensive because he's afraid that you might die. Yeah, and, and now Hot Meowth has really turned this game around. That Flame Wreath Faceless connected for nine thanks to the Flame Tongue Totem. Mm -hmm. And now Dude is just in a really tough spot. He has so much of the late game attrition style, the high end finishers uh, in his hand, has not found an execute and really doesn't have a great way to deal with this board. Well, he has Cork on lead to remove the Flame Wreath Faceless. If he trades Alex Rush Champion and Azure Drake, of course, in the right sequence to make sure that he doesn't lose the Azure Drake, he can. He would still face uh, five power on the board, but he can place Fierce Monkey in the way mm -hmm. to block some of that damage. Yeah, he can take out some of the board, but not everything. Mm -hmm. And Hot Meowth does have a second copy of Feral Spirits, and he will still have this Flame Tongue Totem in play. So. Uh, Dude is going to need to weather the storm here. And he will be able to, to start leveraging those expensive cards in his hand. He's going to hit eight mana next turn, which means Grom can come down. And that is a card that certainly has the ability to really swing the game around. Hot Meowth finds Tunnel Trog. Not the best card here. It is, it is something that he can play alongside Feral Spirits and get another minion on the board. Uh, Sir Finley will find some options. Steady Ooh. Shot is certainly an attractive one, given that he can push quite a bit of damage, but he also needs to be concerned about his own life total here. Yeah, he's at 15. Uh, definitely the sweet spot for the Dragon Warrior because of Dragon Warrior Crusher. Um, also because Gromish is very close to closing out the game. Still very much aware that his opponent can't do it next turn because eight mana is not enough to activate Gromish by itself. Um, and then there's also the concern of, you know, how fast can I kill my opponent? I don't really exactly have the most power on board, so how fast can I kill him with Steady Shot? Some Dragon Warrior lists run Deathwing. This is not the case. So there's one of the things that Hot Meowth has to consider. Like, if I play the long game, will I get blown out by potentially these late game cards? Um, and the only really late game card outside of Gromish that Dude has in his deck is Ragnaros, and he doesn't have it in his hand. Well, now Dude has the opportunity to potentially use Grom for removal uh, if he wants to get that down and also just threaten big damage in the future turn. The problem there, of course, is that he leaves himself with just Grom in play if he uses the Azure Drake plus Grom to remove the two uh, the two Feral Spirits. Mm -hmm. And then his opponent has six power just sitting facing him on the board and plus Steady Shot. One of those minions is a Tunnel Truck. There's a lot of draws he would just die to. Right. Doom Hammer, Lightning Bolt, Lava Burst, uh, another Flame Tongue Totem. <laughs> the list actually goes really high. Um, and here's like the a really annoying thing too. If you play the Curator and take a defensive stance, you draw Sir Finley Murgleton, which I don't know if you actually want to switch yeah. hero powers because the fact that your, your, your warrior hero power is really useful to stay alive. And this is what even amazes me more is that dude actually had a great start and Hot Meowth not only got bullied in the first couple turns, but his hand wasn't exactly looking amazing until that flaming faceless turned the board state around. Here it will, will be Grom coming down and dude clears off as much as he can. Hot Meowth has a draw to find Abusive Sergeant. That's not quite enough damage. Two off. Very close though. He's just going to put his opponent not having the damage to kill to finish the game. Five damage needs to be coming here from Dude. But, well, does dude he have do, anything? Dude still has 
curator plus hero power to keep himself out of range. So this right. is this game is not over. Grom can potentially take out the flame tongue totem, as as, as scary as uh, or as sad as that might be. Do you want the flame tongue totem, or do you want to kill potentially something else? Maybe Ooh. the tunnel trial grips it's bigger threat. It could, it could. The, killing the flame tongue totem means that your opponent is left with. Uh, just three damage from the uh, Sir Finley and the Abusive, so he can't get through. If he draws any Overload card, he'd be able to get through yeah, with the Tunnel Truck potentially then. It's, it's a really interesting spot exactly what he chooses to remove here. Yeah. Oh, Finley, of course, not as comp uh, not as useful. There are instances where sometimes you hero power, play Finley, try to find the second defensive hero power. Yeah. So here, yeah, dude in the tank, but what he wants to remove, looks like he is going with the Flame Tongue Totem. Yeah. It's guaranteed damage, right? The, right. The, the fact that the Flame Tongue represents four damage and the Tunnel Truck is three, which could scale up. Flame Wreath Faceless, that will boost the, uh, yeah. the Tunnel Trog That's enough. just enough. So that is two power, and that means two damage gets through from the Abusive Sergeant. Oh, man. One damage did end up mattering this game. It it's really exact did. lethal. And hey, if you remove the Tunnel Trog, does that mean he would have survived? It's. I think, think he might have survived that turn. There would have been just the Trog. Well, the Trog... Yeah, he would have, he would yeah, have actually survived that turn. He would have turn. overkilled the curator, right. and then uh, at that point, he actually has to rely yeah. on that, and then Grom maybe was able to turn around. It's really close. I mean, who knows? Dude wasn't guaranteed to win the following turn right. anyways. Um, very, very close game, and Hot Meowth is able to persevere, and despite the bad start, take the game with a 2-0 lead. Let's uh, get to know Hot Meowth a little bit better as we get ready to see game number three, and whether or not he can jump out to a 3-0 lead. Uh, I know you're involved in the uh, Vicious Syndicate, uh, the data report. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. How did you get involved with that, and how has that sort of helped you with, with competitive Hearthstone? Um, I started getting involved in like more competitive um, this year. I went to the winter and spring prelims, and I got to meet like a Vicious Syndicate like guy and like team members there, and like they kind of introduced me to their community. They invited me to like, expert classes for um, their um, data report article. They share like the statistics, like what are the like best classes, like class frequency, how like the win rate matchup for each deck. I think um, that's kind of like um, calculated luck, just cause like I bring like the better decks to have a have an edge. So like I can't have like a 70-30 matchup, so I can increase my probability. But like when you can see like how like the numbers match up. Like, you can, like, have an edge. It's kind of cool, like, kind of like science in a way, but it's kind of cheesy to say. In the Vicious Syndicate data report, you're the hunter expert. Why, why are you the hunter expert? Uh, it's kind of funny, because, like, the reason I'm in, like, I was supposed to, like, fuel in temporarily for, for a guy who was busy, but I ended up being the full-time hunter expert. So I don't play on um, hunter, like, too much on the ladder right now, but I did bring it in my tournament lineup. So I'm actually confident with Hunter, and I write about it a lot, so I understand like what the concept and what's a state in the meta right now. Buddy, to the semifinal number one between Dude versus Hot Meowth. Hot Meowth's up 2-0. Uh, me and Kibler did a little bit of a brainstorming on what that final play actually entailed in terms of the math. So Kibler, why don't you enlighten me, primarily. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was interesting. We were trying to figure out the decision that dude had available to him. He could have attacked the Flame Tongue Totem or the Tunnel Truck that last turn. Mm -hmm. uh, attacking Flame Tongue Totem means that he survives against exactly Argent Horse Rider that's remaining right. in uh, Hot Meowth's deck, whereas attacking Tunnel Truck would have allowed him to survive against the Flame Wreath Faceless. Right. And it just so happened that Hot Meowth drew the one the Flame Wreath Faceless case. remaining yeah. and not the Argent Horse Rider. So uh, it, we were also looking at it and figured out that there were only a handful of cards in Hot Meowth's deck that did not win the game that turn. Yeah, so I think there were 18, 19 cards remaining in Hot Meow's deck, and only six of them didn't win him the game. Yeah. So he was really, li like, straight up, of course. And then the difference maker, that seventh card would be Horse Rider versus Family Faceless. So Dude went based off the probability of what he saw, based off the context of his opponent's hand. And he went with ultimately guessing Horse Rider versus uh, the Family Faceless. And that's the kind of stuff that takes a long time to calculate. And very impressive that uh, these are going through these players' minds. Uh, didn't work out for him, but the series is still young, Kibler. A 2-0 lead is definitely discouraging for Dude, but he can still easily climb back. I mean, we saw Hot Meowth come out to a 3-0 lead in the quarterfinals against Monsanto, and 
was fought back to a three to three, uh, largely due to his uh, his Zoo deck underperforming, but this is not underperforming here. Hot Meowth with a turn one Fandral Staghelm and Dude with no execute. So this could be a rough one for uh, for the Dude. Yeah, not a great start at all. Fandral Staghelm, one of the strongest cards in Whispers of the Old Gods. I definitely slept on how powerful it was. I definitely thought it was like, oh, it's a pretty good card. And I didn't realize this card is nuts. And absolutely destroys uh, villages and homes and, <laughs> and divides families. Yeah. I, th I think the, destroys the, careers. I think the fact that uh, that it has such a powerful interaction, specifically with wrath, which we see in Hot Meowth's hand, that's one of the the major interactions. Just getting a two cost uh, removal spell for a four health minion that draws you a card is absolutely huge, yep. uh, and that's likely to be the interaction that we see this game as dude has just a bunch of minions that all happen to have four health he can play next turn. My personal favorite moments are when Fandral plays with Raven because it just feels like you get incredible value for one mana. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you also get situ you get a lot of powerful choices. You get six choices, and then you can get choose two of them that pick the best situation for the game. Um, so that's my personal favorite moments. This definitely is nothing to shake your head at. Wrath is very sick here. This is actually an interesting decision from Dude because I think he recognized that if he played Blood to Icker, it might get killed by a Wrath if that's waiting in Hot Meowth's hand. Oh. And if uh, he, if Hot Meowth had not had to, to Wrath that, he would have Wrath remaining for a three drop here. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dude did pick up an Execute, which we'll see if he decides to use. But I, I really like that Blood to Icker play from Dude simply because it potentially protects his next turn's play right. from exactly the card that Hot Meowth ended up using on the Blood to Icker. Right. Because then all of a sudden things like Fiery War Axe and Slam become much more relevant to killing Fandral if you didn't deal with that 2 2. It also threw Hot Meowth off of his Wild Growth turn. And Hot Meowth decided to wrath that because he didn't want to lose his. Uh, Fandral to perhaps a Fiery War Axe the following turn. So, you know, so identifying what your opponent is expecting your play means is one of the very important things, especially at a very high level. And Dude correctly anticipated that Hot Meowth would read him for War Axe based on that play and played around it, which set all of his future turns off because he wasn't able to Wild Growth. Certainly. And these little sm seemingly small decisions could end up affecting the outcome, very similar to how the previous game do started off with what seems to be the, the, the nuts hand. He has Fiery War X and Alex's Champion and a proper curve. And Hot Meowth didn't actually have anything really. He just got bullied. Uh, but yet Hot Meowth ended up taking the game. So if you do end up seeing it swing the opposite direction, perhaps that's because of the way Dude was forcing awkward plays from Hot Meowth. And Dude is in a sad spot I've been in many times with no dragon in his hand with oh. that uh, Alex as Champion here. So sad. It's really the most tragic thing any person can, uh, can experience. I'm crying a river of tears. I, I think you're lying to me. I'm pretty, sh I'm pretty sure in about a few years we'll see Steven Spielberg make a documentary based on this very moment, not holding a <laughs> dragon and then play some soft violin music with black and white motion pictures. It'll be great. And you You'll win the Oscar for you know, d d director of screenplay and best male lead. No, I, I wanted to play the dragon. The oh, okay. Come on. So best supporting lead or supporting actor. No, the dragon is the lead. Yeah, you're the best supporting it's a, it's it. It's moderate. Yeah, no, like, yeah. I'm playing the dragon. Though. Right. Yeah, gotta, oh, so the dragon is the lead. <laughs> so what's, why are you refuting my statement? <laughs> Anyways, uh, despite having no dragon, dude does play his Alex Jaws' champion. And uh, alongside it, a frothing berserker. Trying to get aggressive here. This is a matchup that if it goes very long, the druid deck is capable of doing very powerful things. As we see uh, Hot Meowth with Malagos and a couple of... Potentially explosive cards with Malagos in his hand, and he already has the potential to play uh, Malagos plus Moonfire in the following turn. He has nine mana on his next turn thanks to his ramp effect. Yeah, so the days of the Father Berserker are numbered. Question is if he wants to spend the Living Roots to remove now. He could remove the Alex Ross's champion. It feels, it feels like if you do remove it, you're going to be gaining... A a decent amount of health because your opponent most likely should be able to deal with this uh, Meyer Keeper pretty easily. Yeah, Hot Meowth here is trying to figure out if it's worth using the Living Roots on the champion here because of the Malagos in his hand. The Malagos is so powerful alongside those cheap uh, burn spells that Hot Meowth decides he's going to let that hit him a couple times. 
uh, in order to enable his Malagos to be even more right. powerful. So he's foregoing four health to keep the Living Roots at least, because he's accepting that Alex Josh's champion will hit him not only this turn, but the next turn when he plays Malagos and inevitably snipes the, the Frothing Berserker. This is also assuming your opponent deals with Meyer Keeper in a very efficient manner, which Fiery War Axe lent itself to do. Due to also calculating damage, uh, Ravaging Ghoul is something to consider. Um, the Fierce Monkey, though, feels a little bit more appetizing because it's better stats, plus, you know, gets ahead on the board. Well, dude could play the Fierce Monkey and the Ravaging Ghoul, which would cause a lot of triggers on that Frothing Berserker. That's also true. Uh, then attack in, make the trade with the, uh, the champion himself, which he has to be thinking that, okay, is it worth getting the damage on my minions if I'm facing something like Wrath or uh, Azure Drake plus Living Roots that would be able to remove yep. his... Uh, his Frothing Berserker, which couldn't otherwise. Yep, and I think also above everything else that's also going through Dude's mind is how Meowth hesitated on three mana right. for a very long time. He's already played both of his Wild Growth. He saw an inner vase, so he's like, what is he possibly planning? Can I put him on certain ranges of cards? And this is going to be the big Frothing Berserker hit. Going to go ahead and give that uh, Berserker plus five, or rather four from the Six, Ghoul itself, maybe? and then seven total, I believe. Right. Six total. Yeah, so it's, uh, from the trade, gets plus two there. So it, I imagine that, yeah, immediate Malagos Moonfire taking out that Berserker, but Hot Meowth is pretty low. He's down to just 15. Yeah. He, he does have a Raven Idol. That was actually a very big draw for Hot Meowth here because it gives him another, uh, another way to dig for damage to go with Malagos. Yes, potentially getting the swipe, which would be almost, it would be perfect, right? Just to swipe and clear the board here. It is going to be dicey, though. He is not playing with the most amount of health, and his opponent just drew three cards from the Curator. Oh, my Ooh. goodness. Gadget and Auctioneer plus Raven Idol. Hot Meowth played that Auctioneer pretty much instantly. This does cut him off from being able to play something like a Swipe or a Starfall, and he finds a Starfall. Not enough man. So because he played Auctioneer, he cannot play a Starfall this turn to wipe out dude's entire board. He only can... Pick. Okay, I was thinking the Innervate to eventually cycle through, but he's going to try to oh, see if he can finds alive. another Raven Idol. This gives him the opportunity to find another yet another roots. burn spell. Oh, Finds an Innervate, too. This is he is just chaining miracle. off, and Healing Touch allows him to Innervate into Healing Touch to get himself out of any kind of possible lethal range this turn and just clear off almost the and entire board for Dude, and there's the Golem, too. Play the Giant. That is what the Druid deck is able to do, and that's why they call it the Malagos Miracle Druid for a reason, because the Gadgetan Auctioneer keeps him alive, and Hop Me Out's gamble pays off. And yeah, that was, you know, we saw him shaking his head a little bit after the Discover when he couldn't really take what he wanted to take, but... Uh, that draw of Innervate into Innervate was pretty gigantic. Yeah, no pun intended. With the Arcane Giant as the punctuation mark, dude picks up the Draconoid Crusher, uh, which, of course, doesn't relevant in terms of the activation of its battle cry any longer. Dude has also s kind of prioritized the best way. Well, first, if he can kind of uh, gather himself, because you can see his visual uh, reactions to the entire turn was... Uh, just grimace after grimace, but after he's able to compose himself, what's what's the best play in this situation? What's priority removal number one? I mean, he is in a terrible position here. He doesn't have another execute. He doesn't even have a big minion that can stand up to Hot Meowth's board. This is a spot where you know, dude needs to try and figure out: Can I even try to you know race or anything here? He if that uh, auctioneer stays on the board. The game can just end up getting totally out of control as Hot Meowth just draws tons of extra cards each turn. But at the same time, if you don't just push damage to the face, your opponent can just kill you with the big minions he has already. So, and Hot Meowth now, this is this is the moment when you're playing this deck that you're just like, I don't even know what to do. All my options are too good. Because you have Malagos, you have Auctioneer, you have a Giant, you have a handful of spells. I like the kill him option. <laughs> you're, you're very close to just being able to do that, I think. He has, what, 16 on the board, plus 7 from his hand. So he's not able to actually end the game immediately. He can cycle a Wrath, and if he finds Swipe, he's able to do that. Yeah, he can also Living Roots the face to see if he can draw the cards. Um, so a lot of flexibility here for Hot Meow. And the Cycle Wrath not only does six damage, but also draws two there. cards. There's Moonfire. 
And yeah, this is going to be it. Huge burst from that big turn from Hot Meowth, and he takes a 3-0 lead. Looks a lot like yesterday. Yeah, and at this point, uh, Hot Meowth, of course, making a face as he is known to do. But, um, you know, this this is kind of, people say Rogue not really in the championship. I beg to differ. Rogue <laughs> is very much alive, just in a different form. It's a miracle. He's wearing, he's cosplaying Malfurion. <laughs> And at that point, uh, this is a 3-0 lead for Hot Meowth. He's the one in the driver's seat, currently up 3-0, as his druid was able to defeat Dragon Warrior once again. And we saw him in the spot yesterday. He had a 3-0 lead, and it was the Zudak he had to fall back on. And it was nearly the weak link. He lost three games before he was able to take a win against Monsanto's druid deck. So we'll see what he can do today. All right, so that wraps up the third game of the series. Can Dude make the comeback? We'll find out after you get to know him a little bit better as we get ready for ourselves for game number four. There's a lot of people that sort of play by themselves when they play Hearthstone. What's the value of having players to practice with and to bounce ideas off of? I think part of the reason I got good at Hearthstone is just from kind of picking the brains of pro players on my friends list, just asking people like Amnesiac and Muzzy. Nastro, just a ton of questions. How did you find these these practice partners that you eventually became really close with? Um, I kind of just became friends with them on Battle.net through various ways, like either I play someone on ladder and just add them afterwards because I recognize their name, or uh, like Astro, I played in an open tourney, and then I don't know why he didn't delete me because uh, I don't know, I wasn't that good back then. We talked some more and became pretty good friends. And Muzzy, I also played in an open tourney, one of the best players in the world. What type of play style do you think you have? Are you a risky player? Are you a safe player? I think I err on the side of being risky. I tend to go for the uh, risky play with a large payoff. And that I'm, I'm evaluating that turn from Hot Meowth. I'm trying to do some math on it. I actually have a calculator on the desk, and I feel like Hot Meowth played that turn really fast, so he's either Literally the, the, the descendant of John Nash, or this, or he just kind of felt like he, he's done enough time that he just knew that Gadget and Auctioneer and taking Moonglade Portal, foregoing the Innervate, was the right play. It's, it, it actually actually blows my mind how fast he did some of these calculations. It was it was kind of a if he did. It felt rushed. It if, felt rushed to me. I'm just did, gonna though. say. I, mean, I, I said as soon as he as soon as he just it's his snap yeah. Auctioneer. I was like, whoa, 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 and, slow down there, killer. And, and then go, foregoing Innervate when he has three mana and he could Innervate, potentially pick up the one and eight swipe because he had 16 sword cards remaining, which would have completely removed the board of the Curator in three health minions. There was a lot going on that turn, and he just blazed through it. Regardless, just as fast as we're blazing through the series, we're going into game number four, Warlock versus the Mage. And this is going to be the Zoo Warlock, which, you know, Hot Meow has been saving for last every series so far because he's still a little bit unsure if it's going to work out. And it, it really did struggle in his last match against Monsanto, but I think his matchups here are substantially better. I think that, in particular, this version of the Warlock deck uh, with, the, as you see there, the Demon Fire he's picked up is a bit stronger against the more traditional style of decks that we, uh, we see from Dude. Uh, I, I understand that the inclusion of Demon Fire is to improve the matchup a bit against decks like Warrior, against uh, Druid, because you can just be a bit more aggressive, uh, won't, though it won't really necessarily come up here against Freeze Mage, where he's probably going to struggle. Now, Freeze Mage, you know, is dude's bread and butter. He loves this deck. He chose to bring it, despite the fact that it's always in a very complicated state in the metagame when Warrior is very powerful, and, and then there's other decks that naturally get good against it, too. Um, dude... Choosing to play the turn two Doomsayer, I'm always a big fan of getting Doomsayer out on turn two if you can seize back the tempo and also play something after it. And he has a lot of available options from Accolade to paint the loot order in secret. So this is a very strong play. And the coin into uh, the Lance there from Dude is to protect his uh, Doomsayer from exactly the card that Hotmeath just drew, Soulfire. If it, were, if it weren't for that, uh, Hotmeath would be able to attack into the Doomsayer and kill it off with Soulfire. So Dude just wants to guarantee he has a clear board to drop this Accolade of Pain. Yeah, precisely. Now, Hotmeath does have this Soulfire, which is pretty strong against the, the Accolade. Um, there's uh, pretty much uh, anything get discarded from his hand. He's not going to cry over it. The real important cards are the ones that put the big pressure on, like Doomguard, for example. And he also just has the Malkazar's Imp in play, which draws him an additional card, able to cycle through uh, and reload that card he lost to the Soulfire. 
Yeah, precisely. So dude now has to start figuring out ways he can start removing. What's the turn five plays? If his opponent plays Doom Guard, he's drawing two cards, refilling his hand. Um, how does he best prepare for it? And this matchup, um, as we were talking about yesterday a lot and throughout the championships, Freeze Mage just generally excels by removing on the board because of the way Warlock has to life tap to draw cards. Now, that does change a little bit when Malkazar Zimp's on the board because they don't have to life tap nearly as much. Uh, yeah, we saw Meowth get the card draw off of the Soulfire last turn, and Dude has to be afraid of just a Doom Guard coming down with that buffed up Imp that he can't easily remove this turn. If if Meowth were to play just a Doom Guard next turn, there'd be a ton of pressure, and Hot Meowth would just reload his hand as well. Dude has to make a play. The rope's burning already halfway through. I'm still looking at Loot Hoarder as being one of the primary engines here. Choosing to play Frostbolt as well, so trying to see if he can piece that damage and remove. Hot Meowth, amusingly enough, has a Voodoo Doctor he can use to try and help save this Ip if he wants to. He has Void Walker, also able to uh, protect it from the attacks of the Loot Hoarder. And yeah, it's going to be the Doctor is in, heals up that Imp out of, uh, out of range of burn. Yeah, always a really interesting card to see Voodoo Doctor being squeezed in, in awkward spots, but that's kind of what the peddler is supposed to do, introduce these moments where uh, maybe you find use of cards you wouldn't find otherwise. Actual Doctor One. And Doctor One. Um, Ice Berry, one of the most uh, important cards in Freeze Mage, which constantly cycles in and out, depending on how the metagame is. You know, Ice Barrier is one of the most powerful forms of life gain that currently exists in the in the rotation of standard. Uh, with Heal Bot cycling out and, and no longer having Sludge Belcher, that is one of the most reliable ways to gain life. So, um, you know, a lot of Freeze Mages were debating for a while if they should even cut one of them, because that used to be one of the spots that you would cut for other cards. And uh, Hot Meowth here, he has a pretty decent board uh, that will be going into those Blizzard turns from Dude here. Uh, but Blizzard only kills one of his minions right now. It will only slow down the progress of the others. And uh, that Imp still in play. Yeah, the, the Blizzard doesn't kill everything, but it does heal you for eight health, potentially more bent pending on your opponent's buffs on the board. So I do feel like it's an important stall tool to start considering. I don't think there's ways that you can be greedy. Uh, can you be greedy enough to pass? I mean, you are at 26. Perhaps you want to even cycle the Thalno, so that way next turn you can Blizzard, and then turn eight you can Blizzard Doomsayer. It is important to figure out a way that you can buy some time and then ultimately perhaps drop Alex Straza, or if you have more burn, to start removing and, and card drawing at the same time. Yeah, dude doesn't really have anything like Arcane Intellect, he'd love to just be able to spend a little bit of time digging. And and as you mentioned, those, those blizzards are pretty crucial, especially because he does really want to get a Doomsayer turn off. Yeah. Uh, he knows that Hot Meowth doesn't have access to Craze Alchemist, which has, for a while, kind of gone in and out of these zoo decks. So he wants to try and just set up a Freeze Protect turn for that Doomsayer. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard decision to weigh, you know, dude you know, cutting his flame strikes, trying instead to be extremely lean and mean with his uh, with his burst. Playing a very traditional list. I think um, specifically in his preparations, Laughing told me that dude was experimenting with a bunch of different lists of Freeze Mage, but couldn't really find one that he likes, so he just went with the tried and true safe one with the forgotten torches and no flame strikes. So it just it makes the most sense because it's, it's very efficient at burning your opponent. You're very adaptable to your opponent's game plan. Yeah, and Hot Meowth had the opportunity last turn to play a Doom Guard with his Malchazar Imp in play and chose not to. And the reason for that uh, is that it's more important that he have his Doom Guard later on in order to just generate burst damage past a freeze effect uh, rather than just getting the sort of value out of it by pre uh, preventing the discard loss this turn. So uh, Dude is going to go ahead and remove that Imp, so no discard shenanigans so far. Right. I like this cycle on the Thanos. You, know, you can give up seven health to make sure that Blizzard and Doomsayer can can trigger that way. And also, um, your hand is just looking very feeble. You need a little bit more than just what you have. And you have yet to pick up some of those other big card draw engines that can really start uh, compounding each other. You know, novice engineers and arcane intellects. Yeah, dude, he just is kind of lacking the tools he needs. He hasn't found any of his secrets, really. He hasn't found, ooh, look at that. He gets to discard all of his cards twice. <laughs> That's right. 
Uh, and because he dumped his entire hand, that's actually a good spot for Dude, because now the yeah. Frost Nova Doomsayer is very now, good. Yeah, th now Hot Meowth, he, you know, he decided not to play this last turn, and he's just going to get Blizzard Doomsayer here, and there's no there's no possible uh, Doom Guard into anything. Well, there, there's a Doom Guard, but that's <laughs> not really something you want to play into the Doomsayer here. Is he actually, wow, he's oh, just playing he's gonna it. tap for some faith and believe that the two mana mini can get he's, above. Oh, he got a demon fire! Goodness. That was incredible! Wow. <laughs> oh my god, Hot Meowth with the absolute faith in, in the top of his deck and finds the answer to the Doomsayer. Suddenly, the full board clear is no more and Hot Meowth has just an army of demons in play. Hot Meowth is th up 3 0, and this is a terrible matchup. Like, Zoo wins, you know, people say the average game, the average percentages are 20 to 25% at best for the Zoo Warlock if the Freeze Mage is, you know, very well, well aware of what kind of Warlock it is. So you have to take risks in order to potentially win. And he says, I can't win if I lose my board right. here. I have to go for a Doom Guard life tap into a removal spot, and he gets rewarded for his risk. Uh, can Dude still turn this around? He's got light Ice Block to stall. Perhaps he's got some burn opportunities if he starts fireballing the face. But it, if, if he can't, then he's just stuck hoping his opponent doesn't have enough damage over the next couple of turns. And he's leaving up cards like Brand Bronzebeard. He's leaving up cards like uh, the Doom cards can be super powerful. Yeah, and yeah, that was obviously a huge risk from Hot Meowth investing uh, that that Doom Guard there just in the hopes he could find it. And there would be another card. If he had drawn that Abusive Sergeant, it would have yeah. worked just as well, too. Oh, wow. That's a nice block pop, I believe. Just stacking up all uh, he that He has damage. the brand in place. So this is just a ton of damage. Ice Block popped, and suddenly in what was supposed to be Dude's best matchup here, he's a turn away from death. Unless he picks up another Ice Block and finds a way to chain the damage. Ooh, another Fireball. And you know what? Actually, I think if he was able to sustain himself, he would have had some burn to potentially make it a game. But the fact that uh, Hot Meowth kept Bran on board is just too powerful to pop his Ice Block. He needed Ice Block to survive another turn. So, dude, I don't think there's a way. He's going to try to look through everything, every possibility, because this is the elimination point. But I think Hot Meowth is seconds away from being sweet, from sweeping his opponent, and tr and going to the grand finals on a 4-0 victory. Yeah, it, you know, we were saying yesterday he got that 3-0 lead, and it was this deck that failed him. But it has not failed him here. You know, just a incredibly strong showing with this Zoo deck. And that that timely Demon Fire just taking the risk when he needed to. And we see the uh, Alex Straza. I will play my dragon. I will bring life, but Hot Meowth brings death and advances to the Grand Finals. Yeah, congratulations Hot Meowth. As he said he thought he bought the best lineup, and he expects to see Tere on the other side, so a job well done. And just like that, Dude's end has run, or his run has ended, excuse me, as uh, Hot Meowth is going to the Grand Finals, keeping his BlizzCon dreams alive. And yeah, that was you know, a remarkably dominant performance, 4-0 over Dude, who was the, the pick of many players and many fans to win this entire event. Yeah, and Hot Meowth continues to surprise people and continues to make faces. He is waiting with TJ for a couple of... Yeah, there we go. Uh, <laughs> Mike muted for real, though. Mike muted for real that time. A 4-0 victory, man, really making a statement. Uh, walk me through the Zoo Warlock game a little bit because uh, you had trouble with it yesterday against Monsanto. Uh, you went down, you went up 3-0 again, and you had to fight back. But this time, you actually took it. That was a big risk you took with that Doom Guard. Walk me through sort of your decision making there. Um, so generally, um, Zoo is, for my experience, is 25, um, 75. Um, it's really favorite for Freeze Mage, so I was kind of surprised that I won. And yeah, that Doom Guard into Demon Fire was kind of lucky. I was like, it's so really unfavorable matchup, so I had to take all the risks I can, like all the possibilities I can, because like if that Doom Sir goes off, I pr I'm pretty much gonna lose anyway. So I got really lucky in some of those games, and I also won the um, Agro Shaman against Dragon War, so I won two unfavorable matchups. So that kind of like gave me the edge to stomp him. But Dude is a really good player. I just got. 
pretty lucky. So hopefully my RNG keeps up. All right, man. Well, good luck in the finals, and I look forward to seeing what you're going to pull out. Maybe another 4-0. It was very impressive. All right, well, we're going to jump into